Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today because I get to talk to Dr. Tabitha Stanmore about her book published by Cambridge University Press in 2023, titled Love Spells and Lost Treasure, Service Magic in England from the Later Middle Ages to the Early Modern Era. Um, This book is super cool, right? It looks at the fact that magic is talked about all over the place, loads of different places, loads of different times, um, in lots of different people's lives, but isn't necessarily something we study that way. Um, We often kind of focus on like the really exceptional cases um, or the shiny bits or the really sad bits like witch trials and not necessarily the kind of daily aspect of magic use. Tabitha thankfully has solved this problem for us um, and is here to tell us about it. So Tabitha, thank you so much for being with us. Oh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk to you. I'm excited for this too. But before we get into the book, can you start us off, please, with a bit of an introduction of yourself and explaining why you wrote this book? Absolutely. Um, So yes, as you already said, my name is Tabitha Stanmore, um, and I am currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, And at the moment, I'm actually researching the witch trials. So I've pivoted (laughs) away from um, service magic, which is still my first love, um, and now looking at the, the darker side of magic. But yeah, so I I decided to write this book, um, well, because it came out of my PhD thesis. um, And my PhD was about magic. And as you say, this kind of this everyday magic that tends to be overlooked or ignored, partly because it isn't very compelling a lot of the time. It's not particularly sexy. Um, But what it is, is a very fundamental part, I think, of human existence and human experience and has always been sort of part of our society and the way that we kind of navigate the world. We all have a belief in something. So yeah, so the, the PhD kind of started with me being interested in gender and how gender plays into magical practice. Um, And then I started kind of going down that route and looking at all the different types of magic that um, exist. And, you know, sort of everybody thinks of witchcraft and in the early modern period, which is mostly what I focus on now, you know, witchcraft was seen as something which was very, very scary and it involved selling your soul to the devil in order to kind of do harm to people. Um, But that is only, you know, the kind of the absolute surface of the kind of magical activity that people get up to. And there's things like ritual magic, which is um, sort of understanding astrology really, really well and astronomy and being able to summon demons and control them to get things that you want. Um, And then there's the kind of the humble sort of everyday magic of kind of healing and uh, divination and that kind of thing. And I realized that there's always different types of magic, but they all tend to have the same basic purpose, which is making life easier for, for people. And I realise that that isn't something we tend to look at. Um, And we also don't tend to think of magicians as people who are performing this magic for a useful um, end and then selling it to people because they have the skills to be able to do that. So then I started thinking of magic as a service. And when you do that, it kind of opens up this whole new way of thinking about the world and the way that people lived and interacted with each other. So, yeah, I thought it was worth researching and therefore worth writing a book about. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, thank you for kind of giving us that sort of logic progression of how you got here. That's very helpful context. Um, I think then we need to do a little bit of definition so we know exactly what we're talking about, because it's tricky, right? I mean, even things like what is magic is a tricky question. So can you tell us a bit more precisely what you mean by service magic? Um, and you've given us a bit of an idea of kind of why you focus on that, but anything else you'd like to tell us further on that point, it'd be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Although the question of what is magic, I think is my least favorite question in the entire world. Um, no, that's fair. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking what is service <laughs> yeah. magic? Yeah, that's very fair. Um, yeah, so service magic is p- magic performed to a useful practical end in exchange for a fee, um, put the most simply I possibly can. Um, so, you know, you've got a problem in your life, um, something goes wrong, and you can't think of any way to fix it without using a spell. Um, so you go to a magician and the magician says, yes, I can do this for you. I can fix this problem with magic. Um, and this is going to be my price. And often that price could be... Um, uh, in in money, um, or it could also be um, I- exchange of other services or goods. Um, so often, kind of payment in kind uh, would feature. Okay, 
great. So we have an idea of what we're actually talking about. Um, the other aspect of definitions, I suppose, is not so much what we're talking about, but when. Um, the book, the subtitle obviously says uh, later Middle Ages to the early modern era. So that gives us some sense. Can you tell us a bit more about kind of when and where you focus the book on and also how you decided those parameters? Yeah, so it focuses on England geographically. Um, and the reason I chose England was because any any larger geographical area than that um, would be sort of it would be a lot harder to focus in on and kind of give it a decent, accurate representation of how people sort of interacted with magic because, um, you know, Scotland and Wales even have very different cultures, both kind of magical cultures and legal systems and um, sort of social um, structures uh, to England. So I thought expanding beyond that would be too much. And if I'd gone any smaller than that, then frankly, the sources would be really difficult to find. and I wouldn't be able to do an in-depth study of, uh, for example, a particular county or a particular region of, of England. Um, and when I say the sources are difficult to find, that's because of the period I chose, which was, as you say, later medieval, early modern England. Uh, and that's and by that, I mean, sort of mid 14th century to mid 17th century. And the reason I chose that period was because it's a bit of a Cinderella period, kind of the gap between the Middle Ages, um, so the kind of the 12th, 13th centuries, and sort of backwards, and the early modern period, which people tend to focus more on the 16th and 17th centuries. The, the, the centuries in between the 14th, 15th, they don't tend to get all that much attention because they don't really fall into either obvious category. So I was really interested, especially in... Um, magic studies there's a lot of a lot of research into the sort of 13th and 14th centuries no 12th and 13th centuries magic and then we move on to the 15th and 16th centuries and this this bridging gap is something that people tend to ignore um partly because it's definitely not got the most interesting stuff um and also because it is almost seen as a kind of a bridging moment and i was really interested in that bridging moment um, and the reason I stop at 1650, roughly, is partly because that's when England is coming out of the English Civil War. And then society changes dramatically again, and focuses on magic tend to be sort of a, a little bit more sort of sidelined um, as we sort of move into the restoration of Charles II. Um, so I thought that going any further than that, we're looking at a very radically different society than pre-1640, essentially. Um, and any further back than 1350, was partly already stepping on territory that's already been looked at. So I didn't think it would be the most useful use of my time. Um, and also that's where the sources start becoming a little bit more detailed, um, which means that I would be able to do a lot more useful research in that 300 year period between 1350 and 1650 than on either side of it. No, that's, that's helpful to understand. And again, kind of, I think, speaks to your broader point about looking at the thing we don't usually look at, um, both in terms of the type of magic as well as in the time period. Um, so moving now that we kind of know where, when, what we're looking at, um, can you kind of introduce us to what service magic actually meant? Uh, you trace in the book five most popular kinds of practical magic, so the kind of five main things that people ask for. Can you take us through what these five are and then maybe give us some examples? Yeah, so I'm going to start by saying that there definitely were other uses for practical magic um, and service magic, but yeah, they do tend to fall into five major categories of what people would be asking for. And I think that people should be able to um, sort of empathize with these these causes and uses um, because they speak to fundamental needs of humanity. So um, the most popular kind by a long way was healing magic. Um, so, you know, sort of, well, very simply, you know, uh, healing diseases. Um, and they tended to be healing diseases that couldn't be solved any other way. Um, so we're thinking about sort of chronic illnesses, especially, or kind of wasting sicknesses that come on um, uh, very quickly and then sort of just start wasting the body away over um, sort of weeks or months. So possibly things like cholera we might be talking about, um, as well as sort of longer term ailments like lameness or blindness um, and yeah, things that sort of medicine of the day couldn't really address. Um, it, people would sort of go to the next best thing, which would either be their priest or their magician or possibly both um, to solve this issue. So healing otherwise incurable diseases was definitely uh, the, the main thing that uh, people turned to magic for. The second most common was probably finding stolen or lost goods. 
So that could be anything from cows that had gone missing or had been stolen by your neighbor uh, to really simple things like cutlery. Um, There's a surprising number of people who go to magicians to find their stolen spoons, for example. Um, And that, again, it speaks to the the very basic need um, that people have of certain belongings to get them through their own lives um, and get them through the day even. Um, And also, I suppose I mean, we, we don't tend to think of things like cutlery as being incredibly important nowadays because we have so much of it and it's very easy to go, oh, we've lost a spoon and then sort of, you know, go down to the shops and get another one. But, you know, where everything is handmade and it's quite expensive to get hold of anything or, you know, even a wooden spoon is going to take some labor to, to make again, um, things take on more value. And obviously things like insurance doesn't exist in the 17th, 16th, 15th centuries. So you know being able to recover these items is really important so again you will go to a magician to try to source them if you've kind of looked all over your house and you can't find this stuff uh so yeah healing stop finding lost and stolen goods divination so future telling um was again a very important one and probably actually far more important than comes up in the records because a lot of divination spells are very simple and you could sort of do them every day so um yeah we don't see them uh, appearing in the record very often, but I, I think that's actually just because they were so common, they were barely even worth mentioning. But yeah, it would be divination to see how many children you were going to have, who you might marry, um, whether there was going to be a war coming up in the future, uh, what the weather was going to be like next year. So all sorts of different things um, that you know we, we still do today, right? We've got the entire um, industries uh, dedicated to predicting what's going to happen with the markets and that kind of thing or the you know the weather next year um and you know they were using magic for that what else so we've got yeah magic divination sorry <laughs> healing finding lost goods divination love magic um that was incredibly important and that features all sorts of different kind of sub aspects to it so conception magic was incredibly important um helping somebody to find a a decent partner and sort of marry the right person um getting out of a bad relationship as well there's quite a few spells for that um and also making your partner more friendly (laughs) was often a feature as well and i think that you know sort of speaks to the fact that for a lot of this period um the England was Catholic and divorce wasn't an option. And even after the Reformation and um, the introduction of Protestantism, divorce still wasn't really an option for most people. So, you know, once you're married to somebody, you are kind of stuck with them. So how do you make your life livable? Well, you try to use a spell to make <laughs> make your partner uh, better disposed towards you or just a nicer person. So those are the main four. And I've definitely forgotten one. <laughs> That's fine. That's a lot to be getting on with. Um, I, I particularly enjoy the idea of kind of hunting around your house and then going, all right, never mind. I have to ask a magician. That's, I think, similar in a lot of ways to how people use things like Apple Air Tags or sort of, hey Siri, where are you? Um, and to think of those as kind of continuations, perhaps, of service magic is a really interesting idea. Um, So that's obviously a great example of kind of that particular um, category. In terms of the sort of healing or love spells, do you have a sort of go-to kind of here's what often people would ask for in particular? Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, So yeah, I've got, well, (laughs) I've actually got a spreadsheet of over about 700 uh, different examples um, Mm. or cases of this. We love a good spreadsheet. (laughs) Excellent. Well, I won't run through every single example because that's far too many. Um, But yeah, I think so. One case I really like in terms of um, healing, it it is it's quite a it's quite a flashy case. Most cases aren't like this. um, But I think it's a really interesting one because it shows quite how um, respected and appreciated service magicians healing could be uh, because it features a man called Ferdinando Stanley who was a a noble living in the Elizabethan era. Um, And he was actually very, very well connected. Um, uh, He was part of the Stanley family, which was an incredibly powerful family in the north of England. Um, And he was also, uh, I think, a first cousin of Elizabeth I. So he was potentially in line to the throne. He was um, very much courted by people who thought that he might be incredibly powerful in the near future. And he was also in his mid-30s and absolutely loving life. And then in 1594, he gets one of these bizarre diseases, these kind of wasting diseases that makes everybody panic. Um, And so 
it starts off with him vomiting several times. Um, and then he takes to his bed because he's you know, feeling very, very unwell. And um, people rush to go and get him a doctor, but there aren't any doctors available, any kind of university trained physicians. So they, his servants send away to the nearest um, major town that would have a, um, a university trained physician that could come and attend to him. And in the meantime, they get a, um, a cunning woman to come in and look after him instead. And she is very much a service magician. We don't know how much she was paid because it's not mentioned, but I'm fairly certain that she would have been paid in kind in some way, possibly with food or possibly some kind of, um, I don't know, privileges or something like that in in the sort of the Lord's estate. Um, and she clearly was, you know, well, she, it says that she was very old um, in the uh, original documents. Um, and I imagine that she was probably the local healer for a lot of other people. And she must have had a good re- reputation to be trusted enough to be handed over to um, Ferdinando Stanley to look after him. And she basically diagnoses him as being bewitched. And she says that the only way that she can possibly help him is to sort of take the disease into herself. So she does this and she kind of gives him some drinks um, to sort of soothe his aching belly and calm him. He starts hallucinating and he seems to calm down when she gives him these drinks. And there are a mix of different herbs. Rhubarb is mentioned at one point. So it's kind of a rhubarb herby drink. But she's also sort of saying prayers and spells over this drink before she gives it to him. And then every time he starts to be soothed, she ends up vomiting um, the same kind of russety red liquid that he's been vomiting. So she's she's demonstrably taking the disease into herself and sort of easing his pains in the process. Um, unfortunately, Ferdinando did end up dying, um, although whether that's her fault is very debatable because once the physicians did arrive, they treated her very, very um, badly and basically threw her out of the room and said, you know, get out of here. You're, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and she said, well, you know, he's definitely been bewitched and I'll do what I can from a distance. But, you know, there's not much I can do at this point if you're going to you know, make me leave. Um, and then and then Ferdinando dies uh, a few days later. And the surgeons that who have come to um, be at Ferdinando's bedside actually end up agreeing with her and saying that, yes, he probably was bewitched. So there's kind of a, even though she's very much not um, an acceptable part of kind of the medical tradition uh, at the time, in many ways, she's sort of an outcast in that sense. She, her professional opinion is actually respected. Um, eventually by the by the physicians, which I think is just such an interesting kind of interaction mm-hmm. uh, between magic and, I suppose, formal uh, scientific, pseudoscientific mm-hmm. knowledge at that point. No, and it, it very much kind of goes to this overall sort of myth busting that you're doing of kind of, at least the popular conception might be that service magicians are sort of, you know, the, vi- the cottage at the outskirts of the village that you go to secretly. And that's not necessarily always the case, right? There is interaction here. There is kind of a known um, thing happening. Um, I found the fifth category and I know why we both forgot it, because in some ways it's similar to kind of what you were telling us about the cutlery example, um, the finding of buried and lost treasure. Which, Thank you. Yes. You know, can cover a whole bunch of things. And depending on how nice your cutlery is, is it recovering stolen or lost goods or is it recovering buried treasure? I'm sure it could, in some cases, go either way. Um, given that you've kind of, in some cases, given us an example of that and just of healing, is there maybe a love spell example we should be aware of? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, there are a few. Um, so, yeah, I've got a couple. So I mentioned before that, you know, one of the reasons that love spells exist is because it's trying to make people's lives easier. Um, and there's a really nice example of that from a woman called Joan Squire uh, from 1474. And she is brought up um, before the ecclesiastical courts, so the kind of the church courts who are uh, responsible for policing the morality of people, um, because she's told her neighbours about a really wonderful spell that she's found to make her husband, and I quote, um, obedient to her will. And it involves basically washing your husband's shirts in uh, holy water. And I don't know whether that's meant to be some kind of blessing to sort of bring kind of the grace of God down onto your husband to make him just a better person, or whether it's something about harnessing the kind of the inherent power, um, the inherent inherent divine power um, in in holy water and kind of using that to sort of push your own will onto somebody. But either way, um, the idea is, yeah, that to um, that, that this will make your husband much more loving and um, much easier to live with. 
And she says that she's been using it for years and she's very, very happy with it. Unfortunately, one of her neighbours says, you know, <laughs> this is clearly blasphemy and that's why she ends up being um, taken to, to the church courts. She's not really punished for it. Um, she gets told to not do it again. Um, I imagine her husband also thinks this. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the kinds of sort of everyday love spell that was probably going on across England. Mm. Um, a darker example comes from John Muir, who was a, a student um, in London. He was, I think, part of Middle, no, just Temple, um, the kind of the, the law courts and the kind of the law school um, in 16th century London. And he really wanted to get married to a particular woman called Aditha Best. She wasn't particularly interested. Um, and so he says he's going to summon a demon and the demon is going to torment her until she basically consents um, to his will. And yeah, I, the two examples I think are interesting because they show the different kinds of powers that could be worked with um, with uh, with magicians and with service magicians. Um, because we you know we've got divine power on one side, and then we've got demonic power on the other. And you know that there and and the kind of the, the level of simplicity or complexity that these spells use is also really interesting. So you know, for um, Joan Squire, it's a very simple act of washing and just making sure you had the right ingredients, I suppose, for the spell. Whereas for John Muir, he would have been using very complex rituals to sort of summon a demon into a magic circle or something like that and bend it forcibly to his will and then send it away to go and torment Aditha. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very... A very broad range of activities mm. that could be gotten up to and what, what you could achieve with these spells as well. Mm. Absolutely. And very much um, demonstrates the value of having a spreadsheet to keep track of all of it. Um, so thank you for taking us through those examples. If we link then the categories you've just told us about with the idea at the beginning of kind of the time period this covers and the perception that it's often sort of, as you said, a bridging time period, um, to what extent are these five categories kind of the same amount of popular throughout? If healing is the most popular of the five at the beginning, is it still by the end? Is there a change that we can see? That's a great question. And it's a little bit complex to answer, um, partly because we just have so many more sources for the later end of the period than the earlier end. Um, so, you know, and... <laughs> Also, because the sources I'm often working with, which are you know ecclesiastical court records, uh, secular court records, diaries, pamphlets, um, recipe books, all sorts of things, um, often what we're getting is more an idea of what people were concerned about or what the authorities were concerned about and therefore um, actively punishing or at least investigating than the, 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 the frequency of actual everyday use. Um, that said, I can definitely say that they were, were all of those five categories were definitely being used throughout the period um, and were definitely incredibly popular and, um, yeah, sort of, you know, something that people would, would continue to refer to. And I would say that healing definitely stayed very high up there on the list, um, both in terms of people seeking it out. And we have obvious evidences of seeking it out um, and also it being sort of policed and it does become more and more policed as we go through the period, partly because we have a kind of a more formalized, um, or we go through a process of formalization of the medical profession um, with the kind of the founding of the, the Royal College of Physicians, for example, in the 16th century. So we have more, we have a rising concern about whether or not this is the right kinds of things that people should be practicing, um, and especially whether sort of healing magic works. And we have quite a strong propaganda campaign um, from the 16th century onwards against the idea that healing magic works. Um, but the fact that this is such a sustained campaign suggests that it was also <laughs> continued to be very, very popular uh, throughout the period. The same with divination, um, treasure hunting, possibly actually gained. Um, in in interest, I would say, uh, partly because there's a, a kind of a democratization of knowledge uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, partly as a result of the printing press, where very complex rituals, which would have originally have been written in Latin, and they would have been circulated in handwritten Latin manuscripts that nobody else, well, very, very few people would be able to access. And mostly it would be um, priests or monks um, who were able to access this this knowledge it starts being translated into English and then being published on very cheap sort of paper um, and therefore has much wider circulation. So you might have people sort of reading these and being able to summon demons that would help them um, 
or demons, ghosts, angels, all sorts of different things that you could summon that might help you uh, discover buried treasure. Um, and so you might have people kind of amateurs, basically, um, trying out uh, this, this treasure hunting for themselves. So, yeah, I mean... Uh, all of these categories definitely stayed in use and stayed popular because they're still things that are kind of universally needed by people. Um, but yeah, the, the frequency of their use probably changed, although it's very, very hard to gauge from the sources. Mm. Well, and understanding what we can and cannot get from the sources is an important piece of this. So I'm glad you've mentioned that as well. Um, all right. So turning away from the kind of what the magic is doing or what people hope to get from the magic. Can we talk a bit about who is doing the magic? What kinds of people are service magicians? How does one become a service magician? Like, who are these people? Yes, that is uh, a question I can answer very easily because it's pretty much everyone. There isn't really a particular type of person who becomes a service magician. The only kind of slight category that we can kind of discount is the upper echelons of nobility and even then there are some exceptions um but yeah it's because there are so many different types of magic that could be practiced and because they vary so much in complexity it's not really something that's cut off to anybody so yeah everybody from a kind of a traveling um salesman a kind of a a, a um oh what's the word i'm looking for sorry it's completely gone out of my head like a tinker Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, they might have a, a spell that they sort of carry up their sleeve and they're able to share you know, with people as they, as they travel through different villages. Um, Labourers, blacksmiths, um, housewives, brewers, like they might all have spells that they could share um, or that they you know, learned from somebody else. And then, you know, you've got sort of, the, so you have kind of very, very much kind of everyday spell with everyday you know people who are able to kind of develop these um these uh these powers and then kind of develop a reputation for them all the way up to very highly educated people so i mentioned john Muir, who you know is a was a, a university student and you know being a university student was very very rare <laughs> back then um it was only sort of men who could enroll in universities in the first place and you also had to be able to afford that um and also your family had to have the will to actually send you to university so we're talking about a vanishing really rare um proportion of the population who would um get a very good education often that education would involve um a good knowledge of theology and a good knowledge of languages and you kind of need both of those things if you're going to become a ritual magician so you end up with graduates who are potentially not you know, getting any jobs that they want to get they'd often go into uh, working as clerks or um, lawyers but you know if, if the work isn't available then often they would fall back on magic and start selling that as almost like a stopgap sometimes so yeah it kind of it really oh, sorry yeah it really um, varies and as I mentioned, you know, the fact that you kind of need the theological knowledge, priests and monks were very, very into magic, or at least some were. So yeah, it, it's that means it's both men and women. Um, it could be pretty much any age of person. Um, you know, we've got examples of people in their 50s and 60s saying they've been practicing magic for 20 years, 25 years. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's very much, there isn't one type of person, I suppose. And yeah, you would learn this stuff possibly from mentors or from books, depending on your level of education. Um, and sometimes, you know, you would just pick up one particular spell, you know, a cunning person would share that spell with you and then you take it back to your own village and then you'd you know, start sharing it again or start charging for that service. So it's a very organic process in many ways. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, really interesting because I, I don't think that's necessarily the perception that... Um we otherwise would have. So investigating this is a very useful contribution. Again, taking kind of something you've mentioned and asking you to, you know, tell us about it properly. All of this, of course, works because you can charge for this, right? People are willing to pay you something for doing this. How much did these different forms of service magic actually cost? How was pricing determined? Um, kind of the political economy side, I guess, of this whole question. Yes. Yeah. So this is um, something I explore in the book uh, a little bit is I think that magic, because it was because it was technically illegal in one form or another throughout this period, it was um, it was sort of illegal from um, the church 
perspective um, all the way through. And then in the mid 16th century, it becomes a sort of secular crime as well. So the kind of the the um, the, the, the the courts of the land could prosecute it. That meant that um, this wasn't a service which could be regulated um, in the same way that, for example, food prices could be regulated. And they were very carefully regulated um, throughout most of this period. And that means that, as far as I can tell anyway, magic seems to have sort of been functioning on kind of proto-capitalist principles of supply and demand. Um, and you can kind of see that in the way that these uh, that spells are priced because it tends to be, well, taking finding lost goods as an example. Most of the time what we're seeing is the cost of finding an item was tailored to the value of the item. Um, so, for example, uh, a man named William Barkseal was asked to find some stolen linen um, from a, an inn called The Bear in Southampton in the 1630s. And it was clearly a lot of linen um, and it was stolen from the, the, the coaching inn. Which meant that you know it was going to have a real impact on the ability of the the inn to do its job and therefore get customers and you know replacing the linen would cost a lot of money. So he initially charged fifty shillings um, to find this stolen linen. Um, the uh, the family who who ran the bear um, managed to haggle him down to forty shillings in the end. But this is an astonishing amount of money that you wouldn't normally charge for. I mean, it's, it's at least I don't know. Uh, I don't know about a week's wages, something like that. Possibly even more. Actually, probably more than that. Um, so it, it's it's a big outlay um, for the inn to be able to sort of give this, but they clearly think it's worth it. So I mean, William Barksdale is very clearly sort of looking at what they can afford and how much this is worth to them, and then pitching that price. And obviously, it turns out it's slightly too much, so he ends up being haggled down. Um, so if if a good is worth less than that, then you know obviously there's no point in charging more than uh, more than the, uh, the the item is worth, um, and also it depends on how much the the client is willing to pay and how much the client's worth. So um, I don't know. There's a a very famous um, magician, political figure, incredibly controversial, sort of minor. Um, or hanger on of the of, of the um, the royal court in uh, the seventeenth century, called John Lamb, and he actually lays out how much he charges um, for for his clients, and he actually says that he charges a flat fee of I think five shillings, and then I think ten percent of whatever um, the good is worth, or the item's worth. So, yeah, it's it's very much determined by by what um, people can afford to pay and what they think the uh, the, the service is worth. So you can see some people taking advantage of that. Um, at the other end of the scale, if you do just have a sort of a, a humble service magician living in a small village and they know all of their neighbours and the neighbours need them on a regular basis, then you might not price in that way um, because you don't want to alienate your clients. So, for example, quite a lot of um, uh, animal healers who sort of blessed cattle and that kind of thing to stop the cattle from getting diseased for a year, they charge one penny uh, per head of cattle. Um, and because basically because they knew that would be repeat custom. So it was just a nice kind of like general earner um, where you don't need to pay um, charge through the nose because you know that client is going to be coming back. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it is interesting to see kind of how supply and demand it is and how much it does change. In some senses then, I, I, I it almost makes me more curious about my next question because kind of everything you've told us so far in some ways – is a bit sort of, well, let's weigh it up, the pros and cons. Because if we think about the traditional image, service magicians especially, social outcasts, it's illegal, right? You just told us that, but they're going around and having different rates for different people. They're talking to people all the time. They're, they're being asked to do a whole bunch of different things. Loads of people can become um, service magicians. So to what extent was it a social outcast thing to be a service magician and did that change at any point over the time period 
Yeah, it's it is one of those things, isn't it? You do expect um, these to be sort of social outcasts. I think partly because we've got such a strong witch image um, of what that is, and kind of the idea of a um, a vulnerable old woman living on her own, possibly widowed, um, only has a kind of cat to keep her company. And that's I think what we think of when we think service magician, or when I say magic in the early modern period. You know, you think of a lonely witch who's probably just trying to help her neighbours and is being punished for it. And that's. Yeah, I think that that image is it's very very powerful and it's it does tend to mislead us essentially. Um as you say it is illegal and it is definitely something that the church disapproved of, but as I also said it is also priests and monks who are often performing this magic. So it's sort of a do as I say not as I do <laughs> situation some of the time. Uh I think <laughs> It's also, well, the way that I tend to think of it in my head is that service magicians are a little bit like uh, recreational drug dealers, potentially, um, or potentially sex workers, or anybody who essentially offers a trade that people would rather not admit to using, but still use and require. And, uh, I mean, much like recreational drug dealers or sex workers today they you know they fall into lots of different categories of you know relative social acceptability and acceptance um and it's partly to do with how much they trade and you know whether this is a kind of a side hustle or whether it's something which is their, their kind of their, their main job um so, I mean, for example, John Muir, going back to uh, the, the the demon summoner, um, so that he can uh, you know, marry the woman he wants to marry. You know, he would have been very, very central within his society because he was, you know, you know he was clearly from a, a sort of a middle class family. He was relatively wealthy. He was able to have this very good um, uh, education, and he wasn't expelled for any of his uh, activities either. So he was clearly, you know, he he is very central in many ways to a society. But he was still able to perform magic, and if he did perform it for other people as well, then he, you know, wouldn't have been sort of become a, a social outcast from that. But he might have had a a slightly difficult reputation within his class. Um, and he might have also not been sort of tr- fully trusted because he is still working with incredibly powerful forces that he might not be able to control and everybody else is aware they probably shouldn't be using. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, if you are talking about tinkers who are moving from town to town, they're, they're not going to have um, as much sort of social um, currency. Mm-hmm. But they are also going to be trusted enough for people to employ them. So sort of keeping keeping magicians at arm's length as much as you possibly can, but also really needing their services and just accepting that um, and embracing them does seem to be the kind of the, the, the difficult line that society was treading. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So we've discussed what kinds of magic we're talking about, what those categories tended to be, who was providing them, how were they perceived. If we're talking about supply and demand, obviously we have to talk about the demand side of things. Who was actually purchasing magic from service magicians, both actually and in sort of popular conceptions at the time? Yes, absolutely everyone. Um, so a bit like service magicians themselves, they could come from any um, class, they could come from any um, gender and age category as well. Because as I said, these these services are universally in demand. Uh, everybody needs healing, whether you're a young mother who's incredibly worried about their child, or you are sort of 80 years old and you really don't want your arthritis to get any worse you're going to need magic and therefore everybody was you know well every 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 category of person definitely uh did reach for magic or could reach for magic um that's not to say that absolutely everybody did obviously if you're incredibly devout um and you are worried about whether or not you're sort of blaspheming or otherwise upsetting god by performing asking that asking for magic or performing magic then you know you're going to avoid it but for everybody else who had quite a sort of pragmatic i suppose approach to both religion and also survival um you know people would be open to using it Mm. no and again that is helpful in terms of busting some myths picking up on a thread uh you mentioned earlier i'd love to get into that in a bit more detail the idea that kind of how service magic is being used, who's providing it. 
is a bit different between sort of everyday people and the elite. Can we talk a bit more about what those differences might have been? Yes. So in some ways, there isn't a huge amount of difference because magic is speaking to the everyday needs of clients. The way that it differs is because the the needs of of people, of, of different clients, varies enormously according to whether or not you're a member of the kind of the social elite or the well, the nobility or whether you're a, a normal person who is worried about their cows and that means that the things that the nobility were asking for tended to be a little bit more ambitious um, and a little bit more dramatic than you would expect from your average villager so I mentioned that Ferdinando Stanley was an unusual case uh, because he was a noble who had a cunning woman in his room healing him. Um, and that's partly because, you know, no, the nobility had access to the best health care available and also better food. So they were less vulnerable to disease than most of the population. So the nobility don't tend to call all that much on service magicians for healing. What they do have much more interest in is using magic to get money or influence or power. So there are a lot of uh, cases of the nobility having magicians actually on retainer. Um, So kind of keeping them around all the time to help them out. And they often ask them to help with things like um, success in gambling. So magic lucky rings um, that will sort of bring them luck or um, divination and the divination they're asking is sometimes things like you know am I going to get married and who am I going to marry and how many children am I going to have but that takes on an extra an extra edge when you are um, potentially second in line to the throne or um, you know worried about who's going to inherit your estates when you die so there is always that extra aspect to it. Um, and also something that uh, the nobility seem to be very interested in is, you know, who's going to be the next in line to the throne and when is the monarch going to die? So there are a surprising number of nobility who keep magicians, um, as I say, on retainer to diagnose the welfare of the country and also, you know, the, the kind of the political landscape so that they can plan in the future. So, yeah, it's kind of it's the same basic principle of we want divination magic, but for a very very different end, and that also is um, reflected in the in their treatment of magicians and also the kinds of spells that they use. So, in general, the nobility aren't using your average humble cunning woman who lives in a village and mostly blesses the head of cattle. They might have somebody else in their household who is still employing that cunning woman. But for themselves, the nobility would usually get somebody who is one of these university grad- graduates who has a good command of different languages and understands things like exorcisms and other rituals so that they can um, employ them, make them part of their household. And if you're, if you're sort of employed as part of a noble, noble's household, and that means that you sort of, you've pledged your loyalty um, to your employer and also live with them. Um, and you know they, they're asked to do incredibly complex rituals that could take days or weeks, and those rituals will result in hopefully um, finding a lot of money that's buried you know in the countryside for your employer, um, or as I say, these kind of these lucky rings um, and that kind of thing, which are incredibly expensive um, to to make and incredibly expensive as a sort of commodity to sell. Um, so yeah, we're kind of. We're talking about just a kind of a, a higher echelon of magician um, with much bigger prizes as a reward for the that the higher prices are also charging. Intriguing to see kind of what is different, but also what's not different that I think tells us quite a lot as well. If we stay at kind of this upper echelon of society um, and actually go not just into the elite, but really into the monarchy, What can we learn about the monarchy's position on magic and magicians by looking at what's happening in terms of service magic use by the elite? Officially, the monarchy consistently condemned um, magic and magic use. As I said before, uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries, um, magic was very much under the purview of the church. But by the 16th century and under Henry VIII, magic starts being policed as a um, as a secular crime. 
And that's partly because um, the, the Henry VIII and also Elizabeth I and after that James I um, were all very concerned about um, the, the power of magic to do the monarch harm. Um, there are quite a few magical assassination attempts that turn up during their reigns. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they do want people to stop using magic because it is seen as both a threat to the realm and a threat to them personally. But also none of these monarchs and the monarchs that preceded them were particularly concerned about them using it or their nobles using magic, so long as it was being used in a way that wasn't harmful to to the monarch himself. Um, Elizabeth I very famously employed John Dee, uh, the sort of polymath, mathematician, um, astrologer, and also very much a magician, uh, John Dee, who... Um, basically divined whether or not her coronation day was a good one or sort of, you know, a fortuitous one. Um, and he also even offered actually to um, use his magic to be able to find gold mines across England. Um, she actually rejected that proposal, but, you know, he was still <laughs> somebody that she had basically on speed dial if she needed him um, for any kind of magical services. And this is, you know, the same the same monarch who introduced an act against witchcraft um, and you know, had people investigated for the kinds of magic that they were performing, which could be very mundane, everyday stuff. So it's again, it's very much a kind of one rule for them, another rule for everybody else. And that could be very useful because if you do have um, nobles sort of living within your court who you know are practicing magic on a regular basis for all sorts of different things, whether that's securing the right partner or... Um, you know, just sort of, yeah, giving you luck or whatever, then you kind of have them in a trap because you know that they're performing this kind of stuff and you're letting them get away with it or, you know, Elizabeth letting them get away with it until the moment where they seem too much of a threat and then you have a very easy thing to condemn them with. And you sort of see that um, coming through in earlier periods as well with um, Edward the Fourth. Again, magic wasn't a secular crime uh, during Edward IV's reign, which is the 15th century. But he did end up um, having his brother, his younger brother, executed partly on a magic charge because he was found to have been practicing magic partly to assassinate Edward IV. Whether or not he actually was is debatable. Um, it's fairly certain that he was, you know, uh, his brother George was using magic in some capacity, and therefore there was enough rumour surrounding George that this could become a credible, um, uh, a credible charge to use against him. So, yeah, the monarchy was basically very, very pragmatic around magic and was very happy to use it when it served them and very happy to condemn it when it didn't. Which, again, goes back to that idea of kind of the social outcast versus not. Um, and I think adds a lot of helpful nuance to our understanding of what's actually happening here rather than what we might assume. So we've gone from kind of we've covered what is service magic? Why are we focusing on it? What kind what did people actually want? Who's providing it? Who's buying it? How did the law see it? How did social um, how did kind of society see it? How did the monarchy see it? I think we've covered rather a lot. <laughs> and there's clearly a lot in the book, um, but I will uh, recommend to readers, uh, despite covering all these things, the book is not like 600 pages long. It's actually much more concise than that. Um, so if you're intrigued, definitely check out the book. Um, it's it's really, it's not going to, you know, if you throw it at someone, it probably wouldn't hurt that much. It's actually really <laughs> concise. So I therefore only have one final question for you, Tabitha. Um, you mentioned it a tiny bit at the beginning. This book is obviously done. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what you're working on now? Yeah, absolutely. So as I say, I've, I've moved on to, on to witchcraft now, <laughs> um, which is really interesting. Um, I'm having a great time. So yeah, at the moment, I'm part of the Levy Hume funded um, Seven County Witchcraft Project, uh, which is being run by Professor Marion Gibson at the University of Exeter. And it's basically exploring the 1640s witch trials um, in the east of England, and which are often sort of thought of as the Matthew Hopkins witch trials, a kind of witch finder general who went and sort of committed mass murder um, with his witch finding uh, brigade, essentially. Um, but what we're trying to do is look more at the, the 
the accused themselves and their families and their accusers and kind of get a more sort of social history and a better idea of what what their lived experience was like and what happened um, in their lives both before and after uh, the witch trials because a lot of them survived um, and carried on having to live within their communities even after they'd been accused um, and sort of potentially tortured and you know then put through this ordeal. So yeah, that's what I'm looking at at the moment. And a thing that I'm focusing on within that is what happens to the children of witches or accused witches, um, because you know we we just don't know. And a, a bit like how um, service magicians were sort of in this difficult category of not quite socially outcast because they were needed, but also not quite accepted because they were sort of tainted in some way by using this kind of um, illegal force children of witches probably carried on you know, that you know that that reputation that their parents had given them um for the rest of their lives so kind of what happened to them and how did their society treat them is um yeah a question that i think is really interesting and what i'm trying to get to the bottom of right now absolutely fascinating thank you for giving us that sneak preview um but while you are trying to figure that out of course listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled love spells and lost treasure service magic in england from the later middle ages to the early modern era published by cambridge university press in 2023 tabitha thank you so much for being with us on the podcast oh thank you so much for having me 